Mitch. I miss you. Mwah. Good morning, UBC. Just on behalf of the pages and behalf of United Back Church, I'd like to welcome everybody to church this morning. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts! My soul longs, yes, faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young at your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Blessed are those who dwell in your house, ever singing your praise.
like to invite everybody to pray with us. Dear Heavenly Father, we just ask that you be with us this day, that you meet with us no matter where we are, though we're scattered, um, that you unite us uh, through, your, through your word. Father, we just pray that you uh, use Chris this morning in a mightily way, that he uh, his message of um, not being anxious about anything that this world can put on us, Father, mm -hmm. is one that every one of us needs. Father, I just pray this day for Chris. Pray that his message rings true with each and every one of us, Father. We lift this day up to you and give it to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading for today is Luke 12, 16 through 32. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, this night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And he said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap, they have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. How much more value are you than the birds? And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to his span of life? If then you are not able to do as small a thing as that, why are you anxious about the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass, which is alive in the field today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, how much more will he clothe you? O oh, you of little faith, and do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink. Nor be worried, for all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your Father knows that you need them. Instead, seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. May God add the blessings to the reading of his word this day. Good morning, church. I spent some time this week reflecting on the scripture that was just read, Luke chapter 12, 16 to 32, and a verse that's um, kept playing over again in my mind this week is, is from verse 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And as I've thought on this verse, um, spent time in prayer, I've just been overwhelmed by the compassion and the tenderness of our Heavenly Father towards us. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the wisdom and comfort you speak into our lives. Open our ears to hear the tenderness of the truths we find in Scripture. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. As a father speaks to a child, as a caring shepherd speaks to his flock, so you speak to us. You're generous. The freedom and peace we find in your kingdom is beyond anything this world can provide. It's your good pleasure to give us the kingdom. You desire what is best for us, and you tenderly 
and patiently expose sin in our lives and show us the better path of wisdom. Help us to hear your voice and follow in obedience. We confess we're prone to seek comfort and security outside of your will. We foolishly look to our wealth and our possessions to provide comfort and security. Father, forgive us when our plans are self-centered and not kingdom-centered. Forgive us when the thought of losing our possessions fills us with fear and anxiety. Help us to be confident that our Heavenly Father is loving and in control of all things and aware of our needs. Lord, humble us as we look at the generosity you displayed at the cross. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, you've provided a pathway into the eternal kingdom. Jesus provided a pathway to the kingdom that we could never make with our own human resources. Lord, teach us not to count on our possessions or status or skills. Lift our eyes to the cross. Lord, make us fearless as we're reminded that Jesus showed up for us at the cross and he has defeated death. The good shepherd has laid down his life for his sheep. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Fill us with your spirit so we can live fearless lives that are kingdom-centered. Lord, open our hearts and minds to the truth that the kingdom of heaven is more valuable than anything we could acquire on our own. Thank you for your tender words. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. May we rest knowing we have a heavenly Father that is compassionate and loving, and a Savior that's humble and generously has given his life for our salvation. As we learn to see you more clearly, may we desire to reflect your generosity to the world for the glory of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. It's my privilege to talk with you this morning while Pastor Scott is conferencing. And it's Valentine's Day, so happy Valentine's Day. It's a great day to consider how deeply God loves us. And the magnitude of that love was expressed by Jesus in today's text found in Luke 12, 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That verse encompasses a lot of teaching, but we will focus on the fact that we don't need to fear, for we are God's children because he has given us his kingdom. You may have heard the story of the fellow who visited a psychiatrist because he was fearful that somebody was lying underneath his bed to harm him. The psychiatrist told him that he could help him if he would, wait, if he would commit himself to weekly visits for a year, which would cost him $80 a visit. The man said he would think about it, but didn't return. Six months later, the psychiatrist met the man on the, on the um, road, and, and he asked him why he hadn't come back. And he told him that he'd been cured by his bartender for a $10 drink. Surprised and irked, the psychiatrist asked him what advice he'd been given. It seems the bartender had told him just to cut the legs off his bed, and he hadn't had any fear since. Wouldn't it be nice to have a simple answer to cure our fear problem? Fear not. That's a tall order for anyone. We all have what we consider to be legitimate, worrisome problems. But what did the disciples fear? They had to have had doubts. They had grown up in a strict religious community and a rigid theology and a powerful religious hierarchy. But their hearts and minds had been transitioning to a grace-filled faith, taught by a single leader who loved them and didn't condemn them, but whom their religious authorities had aggressively and angrily harassed. Their newfound faith was being disputed, and they were in physical danger. They were being challenged on all levels, actually, intellectually, emotionally, spiritually, and physically. 
But before speaking of fear of people and circumstances, we should consider a paradox about fear. If we're not to give in to dread and dismay, then, then we must have what the British might call a proper fear, the fear of God. Scripture teaches that this fear is a motivating action that has positive spiritual benefits. That term does convey the idea that God does justly judge and that there are consequences for unbelief and for rebellion against the moral principles which God gave us so that we can live long and spiritually healthy lives. We're going to reap what we sow. However, the Old Testament helps us understand that fearing God doesn't mean living in imminent uh, judgment from a celestial policeman. The psalmist said the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. And let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. As we listen to those verses, the words steadfast love and hope and awe jump out at us. And we gather that God is pleased with those who understand who he is. The overarching idea is that God is patient, caring, and a loving sovereign who has our good interests in mind. He wants to lead us into wholesome living and to give us overflowing grace and mercy. Fearing God benefits us. And the book of Proverbs helps us define that fear in greater detail, telling us it is the beginning of knowledge and wisdom. It prolongs days. It's the fountain of life and keeps one from snares of death and evil. And it influences us by bringing hope and confidence and protection and satisfaction to life. Although we may need to process those ideas longer and meditate a little bit on them, they clearly convey that the lack of honoring God is troublesome. The absence of this awe of God should be feared because not recognizing God means living outside the confines of God's love and purposes for us. And that's not a good place to be. In theological terms, it means living outside of the kingdom and ultimately in hell. Reverencing God is not exclusively in Old Testament theology. The author of Hebrews tells us we'll not avoid God's wrath if we neglect his salvation. And the apostle Peter reminded his believing readers that God was their father and would judge their works so that they should pass the time of their sojourning here in fear. And Paul told the Philippians to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. And he encouraged the Corinthian church, knowing therefore the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. So fear can be a good thing. Focusing on God's holy and pure character and his glory may be terrifying when we realize that his holiness defines our great depravity. But contrasting his holiness with our depravity magnifies the great dignity and value he has given us. His love runs so deep that he sacrificed his son to make us righteous and worthy of possessing the kingdom. Those truths are compelling reasons for loving God with reverential respect and living and sharing the gospel. When we're overwhelmed and in need of physical or emotional support, we really don't want platitudes or somebody to tell us it's okay. We want help. But Jesus was in the habit of saying it's okay to his disciples. He said, don't be afraid when they were in fear of drowning in a tumultuous sea, when they saw Jesus walking on the water and thought he was a ghost, and when they heard God's voice speak on the mountain of transfiguration, and when they were huddling and frightened and locked in a room wondering where the, what their post-crucifixion fate might be. Why were those words from Jesus so helpful and reassuring? Because they were learning to trust his truth and his power and his presence because he repeatedly came through for them. He had done the miraculous. He'd calmed the stormy waters, cast out demons, provided food for thousands, healed the sick, forgave sin, and raised the dead. Although it may not have seemed that he was always in control of the situation, his presence was commanding, comforting, and confidence-inspiring because he never gave in to fear. He lived his life through the lens of the eternal purposes of God and in the will of his loving Father, the way we are meant to live. God always reassured his people when they were in tight spots. Listen as he addresses severely depressed 
distressed Israel caught in Babylonian captivity with a message as pertinent today as it was thousands of years ago. Isaiah reports, do not be afraid for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burnt up. The flames will not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior, because you are precious to me. You are honored, and I love you. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. God steps into the midst of our fears and tells us not to be afraid. Why should we believe him? Because he knows us, he loves us, he's ransomed us, he's with us, he wants desperately to help us, and he wants us to have his kingdom. Leading up to our text, a variety of scenarios had left Jesus and thus his disciples in a very precarious situation. They were in physical danger. The religious crowds was plotting, crowd was plotting against them, and we're told that the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees wanted to trap him. They wanted to find reason to stone him. The truth is, Jesus had lived under the threatening cloud of annihilation all of his life. After his birth, Herod had attempted to kill him via a pogrom of small children. Satan tried to entice him to jump off the temple. He frequently had to withdraw to isolated places to avoid the ire and hatred of the religious leaders. Shortly before speaking our text, Jesus had confronted the Pharisees with some scathing accusations, condemning their beliefs and lifestyles. He hadn't missed his words, boldly reprimanding them. Woe to you, he said, as he called out their hypocrisies and inconsistencies. He had said that the blood of the martyred prophets was on their hands and had accused them of sadistically keeping the people in bondage and under condemnation with their man-made rules. Perhaps the most jarring and incriminating allegation was, woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You did not enter yourselves and you hindered those who were entering. He was saying that these hardened, self-absorbed, unrepentant biblical scholars held the key that gave access to God, but they had never used that knowledge to enter the kingdom. They relied upon their own abilities to be righteous and had missed the beauty of God's grace. Worse still, they had locked their congregations out by their misinterpreted, misguided ideas about rules and traditions and rituals, and had perverted the law of love into a guilt-ridden legalism, into a performance religion of offering sacrifices and the washing of hands. And those facts were extremely disturbing to Jesus, who was God's grace exemplified, and had come to reveal truth, to take away the burden of constant guilt to set the prisoners free from condemnation. Remember when Christ asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Christ had said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Belief in the person and work of Christ is the key that opens the kingdom and it's personal. In our text, Jesus said to his disciples, fear not little flock. Your Father wants you to have the kingdom as a gift. Contextually, Jesus was addressing both the theological anxieties about measuring up to legalistic standards and was saying, you don't have to make yourselves worthy. You don't earn the kingdom. God graciously and mercifully gives it to you. And also, he was referring to the rapidly developing threats facing them. He knew and had warned them that more disheartening, terrifying, faith-challenging events or a short wades down the road. In a few days, he would be led to Calvary and die a horrendous death on a Roman cross for the sins of the world, for our sins, once for all. But even with this terrifying reality hanging over his head, he found the perfect, there's a perfect time for reassuring his followers about the importance and reality of God in their lives, about kingdom living. Jesus tenderly called his disciples little flock, and suddenly he becomes the shepherd of the 23rd Psalm. He is their Lord and the good shepherd, the one who's going to give his life for them. The pastures are going to be rough, and the waters troubled, 
but he will take them to higher pastures and calmer waters and will walk them through them, with them through the coming shadows into this very kingdom that is the Father's pleasure to gift them. Jesus had been prepping them with kingdom thoughts and promises. He's spoken of the prayers for the kingdom, the principles and priorities of the kingdom, and about God's power and provision and providence. He had given them a template for how to pray, the same familiar prayer that we pray frequently when we get together. It's a kingdom prayer that recognizes the authority and priorities of God. J.I. Packer, in his little book, Praying the Lord's Prayer, gives an interesting insight about how the prayer should be prayed. He said the Lord's Prayer is a conversation with a series of questions from God and our answers to these questions. God's first question is, who do you think I am and what am I to you? Our answer is, you are our Father in heaven. So God answers a second second question. That being so, what is it that you really want most? Our answer is we want the hallowing of your name, the coming of your kingdom, and to see your will done and known. That leads to God's third question. So what are you asking for right now as a means to that end? Our answer is that we need his provision, his pardon, and his protection in order to do kingdom work. God's final question is, how can you be so bold and confident in asking for these things? Our answer is the one of praise, because we know you can do it, and when you do it, it will bring you glory. Jesus never treated prayer as some magical answer to a dilemma, but it does bring an answer that aligns with God's purposes. He had told them that sometimes one has to knock, or maybe even pound on heaven's door before it opens. Prayer teaches us to wait, to listen, and to rely upon his will, not only because God's gifts are always good, because God's gifts are always good, and Jesus pointed out that he was sending the good gift of his Holy Spirit. Jesus had not only taught about kingdom prayer, but also about kingdom power, about the differences between the power of God and the power of man. He had said there was no reason to fear, because all that man could do was to kill the body. They should fear Almighty God, who had post-mortem authority to cast a soul into hell. Perhaps John the Apostle remembered this conversation about power when he wrote, Little children, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Seeking God in prayer and trusting God's power are crucial to overcoming fear, but so are kingdom principles those that were modeled by Jesus. Several weeks back, Pastor Scott taught that throughout Christ's wilderness temptation, Christ had trusted God, believed his word, and had the correct worldview that put God above all else. Those are kingdom values. Jesus told them not to give in to self-pampering temptations and unhealthy lifestyles because life is short. And when when we are excessive in our wants, and consumed by our basic needs and desires, our values tend to become perverted to greed, covetousness, and self-absorption. Jesus said that those things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers all over the world, but your Heavenly Father already knows your needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else, and he will give you everything you need. And he told the story of the rich man who felt the need to build a bigger barn to store up the great harvest that he had reaped so that his future would be secure. But then he died that very night that he made that decision. Christ said that the man was not rich toward God because he had wrong priorities. Life is more than a hard scrabble, more than indulgences, or more than financial security. The point is that God provides, so don't be anxious, don't be afraid. God values the human soul and gives it dignity. He knows what we need. Life is about seeking and finding the kingdom, about the reality of God and the restoration of his image in us. Importantly, this kingdom stuff, this prayer and power and principles and providence all fit on the umbrella of God's prescience, his foreknowledge. God knows and he cares about us. Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies? And not one of them is forgotten before God? Why, even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, 
you are of more value than many sparrows. When we are praying and trusting, it is great comfort to know that God is sovereign and that he cares. So we exhorted them to not compromise values and commitment, but to live their faith and to acknowledge him before men. And because of that sincerity, they would be acknowledged before their heavenly father. Conservative Christians tend to concentrate on the problem of our broken, lousy, sinful natures. And it's absolutely crucial that we recognize that about ourselves and that we live repentant lives. As someone has said, our sense of sin is the measure of a soul's awareness of God. But the wonder of it all is that God loves us in spite of us. Christ brings the reality of God's reign into life we now live. If we trust God to cleanse us through the love, his love and righteousness, the one he's given us, he overlooks all the negative things about us. He forgives us and comes to us. He makes us his daughters and sons. Jesus said it right here. He gives your father great pleasure, great happiness to give you the kingdom. The casting crown sing, God is our good, good father. It is who he is. Accepting his gift of salvation reconciles us with God, puts us into his kingdom as his children, and brings us peace. It brings him joy and causes happiness and rejoicing in heaven. So fear God and don't be afraid. He has taken care of us. Fear saps our courage and strength, but we have what we need to cut the legs off our bed of fear. We have God's presence and power, his providence, access to him in prayer, and awareness of king, kingdom principles. We need to give him his rightful place, and the key to the kingdom is ours. Trust and be strong. He wants us to possess the kingdom. <laughs>